everyone. Happy Christmas week. It's good to uh, see you all here with us in person or watching online. Uh, it seems today is a day of welcoming back. Brenda, so good to see you here today. You're the church's Christmas present this year. And hey, welcome back, Sue. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. And John, you too. Uh, they're both feeling better. They no longer have COVID. They're not contagious. So don't be afraid of John today. And don't be more afraid of Sue than you normally are. I have just a few announcements as we begin this morning. Uh, thank you to everyone who came out for our Polar Express movie night uh, on Friday. Jessica said we had about 20 families here all spread out in the sanctuary. And everybody had a great time. Uh, there won't be any more youth activities until the first of the year, so please keep that in mind. Our Christmas cookie caper will be held uh, this coming Wednesday, the 22nd. Everybody's invited to take part in that and to bake some cookies that will be taken down to the Stuhlstrap Retirement Community. I'll remind you of our Lottie Moon offering. That's still going on. Please uh, consider giving to that. And I'll remind you as well of our Christmas Eve service on Friday at 7 o'clock. Please come and worship with us in song and in word. Uh, also, if you remember some weeks uh, ago, our church held a shoebox packing party for Operation Christmas Child. We have a few, a few slides of pictures uh, that were taken that day, and Harvey's going to put that on the screen now. And I think your wife is going to moderate it, isn't she? <laughs> boxes and I already got an email yesterday about where some of them were going some to Africa some to unnamed countries and unnamed countries means that they're not allowed to have um, Christians come into that country so they can't say the name of that country because someone could you know get hurt um, their faith mm -hmm. so a blessing to know that it's going to places that people are not hearing uh, about Jesus <coughs> Thank you to everybody who took part uh, in, in packing a shoebox. And yes, please pray for the children and the families. And save your change to help pay for shipping next year. Um, and uh, you, can, you can shop for shoebox stuff uh, all year long, as Joanne can well <laughs> tell you. Uh, Sue, do you have anything today? Uh, John, and I just want to thank you all for your prayers. And uh, we're just grateful to you all, grateful to the Lord for his healing. Um, if you are interested in sharing your music for Christmas Eve, I'll be contacting you this week for a time of rehearsal. Our friend of the week uh, this week is Milford Hartman. <coughs> he celebrates his 103rd birthday this week. So please remember him. And our college and career friend of the week is Nathan Blacka. And Joanne wanted me to make sure that we announce that we have the cookie caper uh, this Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're uh, able and uh, willing to come bring cookies and pack cookies, um, what, what do we do with those cookies after we get them all packed up, Joanne? We deliver them. We deliver them to the people. <laughs> <laughs> so, they were very Christian last year. What? They were very Christian last year. Yes, we took them down to the Search Art Christian, um, uh, whatever it's called now. <laughs> retirement community, yeah. So uh, please come and help out with that if you can. So, uh, with that, Anthony's going to have our play music for you. <laughs>
remember the birth of Jesus, that we may share in the song of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the worship of the wise men. We pray this season that kindness comes with every gift and peace with every greeting. Deliver us from evil by the blessing which Christ brings, and teach us to be merry with clear hearts. May this Christmas make us happy to be your children, and fill us all with grateful thoughts, forgiving and forgiven. For Jesus' sake, amen. How grateful I am to have these folks in front of me here this morning, our members of our orchestra, and they come this morning to bring a beautiful rendition uh, entitled The Joy of Christmas.
Christmas hymn, O Come All You Faithful. They're not Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life. They're not friends or loved ones who have passed on. Instead, they carry out God's divine judgment. They help us in times of trouble. And they are messengers of the King. They are fearsome creatures, frightening in appearance. And this fourth candle reminds us that these messengers from heaven brought good news. In Luke 2, 8 through 14, we read, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Then suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And this is God's word.
God compels us together to reach a massive city. Mexico City is a free for all. A lot of traffic. Millions and millions of people. They are not an isolated country full of mariachis. We're coming in from Europe, South America, from unreached people groups, and we want to follow those lines to take the gospel all over the world. Our team, we are a small representation of what Mexico is. Different experiences, different backgrounds. We're only a team of 12 people that we can't reach by ourselves. We're seeking to be catalytic in the way that we're working. Invita para conferencias, el internet, el Skype. Mentoring with guys who are interested in pastoring or mission. Seminaries. The local churches. We cannot do it alone. God's still calling me to reach all the nations.
down before this throne of worship. And Father, we just ask that you continue to be with us, guide us, and direct us. And during this season of the year, Father, when we celebrate your son's birth, we just give you thanks for sending him to this earth so that we may have everlasting life. And Father, just now we just ask that you just bless our tithes and offerings and may they be used for the name's honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name.
hard to believe we're already at the fourth and last Sunday of Advent. Christmas is this coming week, and it's, it's just like everything else that's happened this year. It all seems like it's going by in a blur. So today I'd like to slow down a little and get you to really start thinking about what Christmas means. That's what Advent uh, is all about, really, taking a moment to think about the things that Christmas provides, not just during December, but every month, every day. They build, you know, these, these Sundays of Advent. They build upon e each other. We, we first have hope in this child born in a manger, and that hope comes from the love of God himself. Because of that love, we can rejoice. And with our rejoicing comes the last candle here of our Advent wreath, and maybe the most important and the most needed for this year. Peace. Peace. Don't we all need a measure of peace about right now? Such a hard year on all of us, all the worries and the stresses and the fears, so much that we have to keep getting used to. Wouldn't it be great to be able to face all that with the sort of confidence that only peace can provide? But what is that peace? And where do you find it written in the Christmas story? It's in a single verse tucked inside the first chapter of Matthew. But today I want to talk about the wider story around that verse as well. And that wider story is found in Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. Turn with me there. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. And this is God's holy word. I was going to do this whole sermon on Joseph, and a lot of it will be on Joseph, because I love Joseph, and, and one of the reasons I love Joseph is that nobody ever really talks much about him. Uh, it's, it's all Jesus and Mary at Christmas, isn't it? And, and, and I get that. It's the Messiah and the virgin birth, after all. Uh, but Joseph gets the short end of the stick all through the New Testament, and that's always bugged me, because the single man had maybe the biggest and most important purpose of any other man in history. Joseph's job it was no big deal. Just raise God, right? <laughs> Just provide for the child Messiah. His purpose, literally, was to keep and protect the peace. We're introduced to him during what's supposed to be one of the best moments of his life, just before his marriage to Mary. Joseph and Mary are the equivalent of what we would call engaged. Though at the time, in, in, in the Jewish culture, it was much more than that. Among the Jews, the engagement took place a year before the marriage. And in the meantime, the woman who was engaged still lived with her own family. But the pair were still considered man and wife, even though a formal ceremony hadn't taken place yet. And there's a problem here with Joseph, though. Because this woman he's supposed to marry is pregnant. Now that alone, huge deal in those times. Major scandal. But what makes the situation even worse is that the baby that Mary's carrying isn't Joseph's at all. Now take a minute and think about how that conversation must have gone. Mary telling Joseph that she's pregnant. Poor Joseph, right? He doesn't understand how this could have happened. He thought that Mary loved him, but now she's broken his heart. He's crushed and he has got to be angry. And you know what has to be in his mind? The one thing that he, he, he needs to know. Whose baby is it? Because I know it's not mine. Now imagine what Joseph thinks next. And Mary says, well, it's a little complicated. <laughs> because you see, the baby is God's. 
And we see that right at the end of verse 18. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. That's what the angel told Mary just before she became pregnant. Now, there's little doubt that Mary had, had shared this information with some of her very closest friends, certainly with her cousin Elizabeth, who would give birth to John the Baptist. But it looks like she didn't say a word of this to Joseph until she kind of had no other choice. Because Mary was afraid. Afraid of the shame that she was going to bring on her family. Afraid of what this news would do to the man that she loved. Afraid of what Joseph would be forced to do according to the law. And most of all, afraid for the child growing inside her. We get precious few hints in the Gospels about the sort of man that Joseph was. But we do get the picture of a man who loved God and loved his future wife. And one of those hints comes in verse 19. Matthew writes that Joseph was a just man and unwilling to put Mary to shame. The brief pictures we get of Jesus' earthly dad is of a man whose personality is defined by love. But that love had to be tested in Joseph when Mary confesses that she's with child and that child's not his. And then it has to be tested again when Mary says that the baby inside of her is really the Messiah. Now, what does Joseph think of this? He knows the prophecy, of course, every Jew does. And he knows that according to the prophecy, the Messiah will come from the line of David. As it so happens, Joseph is a descendant of David. But he's struggling to believe how this could possibly be true. He's thinking, who am I that the Messiah would be carried by the woman I love? Sure, I can trace my ancestors all the way back to David, back to the greatest king in Israel's history, but I'm just a carpenter. More than that, I'm a poor carpenter. I don't have two nickels to rub together, or shekels. <laughs> I'm nobody. I'm nothing. So that means Mary can't be telling me the truth, no matter how much I want to believe it. These poor, yes, all the glory and the splendor of the house of David is gone by this point. David still has descendants, but those descendants are pretty much like everybody else living in obscurity and barely scraping by. But verse 19 says that Joseph's also just. That's another word for righteous. And as a righteous man, Joseph knows it is morally wrong to keep Mary as his intended wife. He just can't do it. In Deuteronomy 22, we find the penalty for what happens when a virgin who's engaged with, to one man sleeps with another man. And that punishment's stoning. If Joseph does what's right, if he does what the law says, then Mary's going to be put to death. Joseph can't let that happen because, again, he loves Mary. And the sort of love he has for her doesn't depend on anything Mary could ever do. Joseph is just, so he can't marry her. But he's also a loving man, so he can't allow Mary to be stoned. But he's also a good man, so he can't make this divorce public and ruin Mary's reputation. So what's he do? There's a third option. Joseph could get what was called a writ of divorcement, which was basically just a piece of paper that didn't have to state the reason for the divorce. It just said that two people couldn't get along with each other. It was a private kind of divorce. And under the law, neither the husband or the wife were at fault. Joseph could simply walk away, and Mary could continue on with her life as best she could under the circumstances that she found herself in. This had to be a terrible time for the both of them. Joseph loved her, but he wasn't entirely convinced that the story Mary told him was true. Mary could have very easily been shamed, and in that culture, being shamed was just right behind being stoned as the worst thing that could happen to you. She was at the mercy of Joseph here. If Joseph was any other sort of man, if he, if he would have been cruel and violent. Mary would have died in disgrace, and Jesus might never have been born. But God knew exactly what he was doing when he brought this man and this woman together. He knew that for Mary and for her baby to survive, they would need a true man, a real man. They would need a tender man who loved. Still, it was a tough decision for Joseph. Verse 20 starts out by saying, but as he, as he considered these things, Joseph was a thoughtful man, and being a thoughtful man, he didn't act in haste. He didn't allow his emotions to get the best of him. He was angry, sure he was angry, and he was hurt, absolutely. But he refused to lash out 
and all that anger and hurt. He didn't take the path that the law permitted, even though that was entirely within his rights, especially when what had happened to Mary affected both Joseph's character and the character of the woman that he loved. So he wrestled with this decision. Joseph struggled with it. In the Greek, the words, as he considered these things, paint a picture of a deep inner conflict. Joseph's torn here. He's at war with himself over what to do. When we struggle with our own hard issues, when we're trying to find the right path but can't really see it, that's when God will always step in. God will always guide the thoughtful. And that's exactly what happens to Joseph, because just as he's struggling with what to do, an angel appears to him in a dream. Now, to the Jews, dreams are one of the best and most reliable ways to receive a communication from God. Remember the Joseph of the Old Testament's dream. And Jacob's dream of the latter. God appeared to Solomon in a dream and said he would grant Solomon anything he wished. There are dreams that are just kind of the mind playing around. And then there are dreams that serve as God's way of reaching down from heaven to deliver his will. And that's exactly what Joseph's dream here was. And God sent an angel to do it. Now, notice not just what the angel says, but how he says it. First, he addresses Joseph in a very specific way, doesn't he? Joseph, he says, son of David. Notice the first thing that the angel reminds Joseph, that he's a descendant of David. That's exactly what the prophecy said. Remember, the Messiah would come from the line of David. And this is so great. Don't miss this. Why, why is it so important that the angel begins things by saying this? Because the angel addresses Joseph's doubts first. Not his doubts about Mary, his doubts about himself, about his own worth. Doesn't matter that he's just a carpenter. Doesn't matter that he's poor. All that matters is that God called him. That's the only thing that matters. God can and will use any of us, regardless of the limitations we put on ourselves. And then the angel addresses the other big issue, the fact that Mary's pregnant. But he does this very carefully. He makes it plain to Joseph that Mary was already entitled to be his wife. Remember, they're engaged. And then the angel says that Mary hasn't done anything to give up that title. Because what happened is exactly what Mary said. Her baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And notice something really great in, in verse 20 as well. Every time an angel shows up anywhere in the Bible, what's he say? Fear not, right? The angel that comes to Joseph says that too. But in this case, the fear that the angel's trying to take away from Joseph isn't his fear of seeing the angel. It's his fear of taking Mary as his wife. It's a fear that because of Mary's condition, she would be unworthy of Joseph because she'd be a disgrace to him. The angel tells Joseph it's just the opposite. This is an honor reserved for no other man in history. Mary's going to bear a son, it says in verse 21, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That name Jesus was filled with meaning, but at that point, it, it wasn't a very sacred name. It meant Jehovah is salvation, but that name had never been associated with the Messiah until this moment. The angel giving this name to Joseph is very important for two reasons. One is that it brought the Messiah's true mission into a new life. Remember, the Jews were convinced that the Messiah would be a military leader that would free them from foreign oppression. But no, his name would be Jesus, and his mission would be salvation. His conquest would be over sin instead of the Romans. And his deliverance would be from the chains around our hearts instead of the chains around our feet. Second, and this is every bit as important, and it had to be tough for Joseph to understand, it was Jewish custom to give names to children that either expressed the mercy that God had shown them or the duty that their children would owe to the Lord. Right? No problem there. The name Jesus covers all that. But in the Jewish culture, the, the naming of the child belonged to one person only, the child's father. No one else could name a baby. And with the angel saying this, that meant Mary's child was being named not by Joseph but by God. What the angel is saying is that Joseph will raise this child. Joseph 
will provide for this child. Joseph will teach this child and protect this child. But this child is not Joseph's. This child is God's. Don't be afraid, the angel says. Fear not. Verse 24 covers a lot of ground very quickly. Joseph wakes from his dream, and the verse says that he, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife. And Matthew implies here that Joseph did this immediately. He is now convinced that everything she told him is true. His way is clear. He knows exactly what God wants him to do, and so he does it. Mary is completely innocent, and to delay the marriage even a day more would risk her thinking that she didn't have Joseph's complete trust and confidence. But there's something else here, too, and this speaks even more to the sort of man that Joseph was. We have to ask how he could so easily trust this dream to such a great extent. Sure, you know, this was an angel coming to speak to him. And most scholars believe this angel was Gabriel, the same angel who had visited Mary to tell her that she was going to give birth to Christ. And there's no doubt that when an angel visits you in a dream or otherwise, you're going to pay attention. But again, there's more here. These verses don't lay it out in detail, but it's pretty easy to think that everything the angel revealed about Mary's child was what Joseph not only knew to be true, but what he wanted to be true in his own heart. It had to be, didn't it? Joseph understood the angel must have come from God because the angel addressed everything that was in his heart. And the only person who knows everything in your heart is God. So they get married. And it's a lot to do to get married in those days. There was the formal ceremony in front of witnesses. There was a benediction by a priest. There was the marriage feast. Moving Mary out of her childhood home and into Joseph's home. All done as quickly as possible. It's a complete change in Joseph's thinking. One that shows his complete faith and obedience in God. Done with utter joy and total peace. Verse 25 it says that Joseph didn't know Mary until she gave birth to the son that she carried. And it's so very important to believe in the doctrine of the virgin birth as it's laid out in Scripture. But the Bible doesn't say that Mary had no children after Jesus was born. In fact, there are quite a few places in the New Testament that lead us to think Mary did have other children afterwards. The important thing to remember in verse 25, though, is that last sentence. He, meaning Joseph, called the baby Jesus. Didn't name the baby Jesus. God did that. But he called the baby Jesus. Just as the angel had commanded. Joseph's child to raise. To hold. To protect. To nurture. His child to love. But not his child. And Joseph as a good man knew the blessing and the responsibility in that. Keep her up the peace. That was Joseph's job. That was his life's purpose. We celebrate peace on this fourth Sunday of Advent. But what is that peace? We haven't covered two verses of today's scripture yet, but that's how we're going to end uh, today's service. Matthew is recording this story of Joseph and his struggle, of the angel visiting him in a dream to offer a clear path forward. But in verses 22 and 23, Matthew breaks away from the story to offer his own commentary. The angel isn't talking in verses 22 and 23. Matthew is. And this is what Matthew says. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel. God with us. We tend to gloss over that sometimes as Christians. We treat it as just kind of another thing in Scripture because we're so used to hearing the word. But that word means everything. That word's the greatest word ever spoken. As the great evangelist uh, John Wesley lay dying, uh, one of his last words was, The best of all is God with us. The best of all. If you want to know the peace, not just of Christmas, but of the Christian life, it's right there in that name, Emmanuel. And why? Because that name just doesn't mean God with us. It means God with us. It means God with us. And it means God with us. Let's take these one at a time very quickly. First, Emmanuel means God with us. This is the essence of Christmas, isn't it? This is the heart of the entire season. God came down. Everything else that we celebrate and honor 
this time of year, the peace on earth, the goodwill toward men, takes second stage to the fact that this child born in Bethlehem was God himself coming into the world in human form. The Bible tells us this is true everywhere. All the way through the New Testament, we're told in every way possible that Jesus is God. Nothing about Christianity makes sense without knowing this. John begins his gospel by saying of Jesus that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Peter preached in Acts that God had purchased the church with his own blood, speaking of Christ. Time and again through the gospels we see Jesus forgiving the sins of people, but how can that ever be possible if Jesus was only a man? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> It'd be like uh, Kathy stealing my iPad after the service, because Kathy really wants an iPad. And I see her sneaking it to her car, and I run after her, and I say, hey, you stole my iPad. But then Rick comes up and says, hey, Kathy, I forgive you. Now, what sense does that make? Rick can't forgive Kathy of anything. Rick's just a guy. Kathy didn't steal from him. She stole from me. But if every sin we commit is at its heart not a sin against anyone else except for God, and if Rick is God, then Rick has every right to go up to Kathy and say, I forgive your sins. You see, that's what Jesus did. The only possible way for Jesus to forgive sins is if he's God. Or take this, speaking of angels. Over and over in the Bible, when people are confronted by angels, their first reaction is fear. But their second reaction is usually what? To bow down in adoration. And the angels always say, no, 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 no don't bow. You can't worship me because you and me were both created by God. And yet when we see people bowing before Christ in Scripture, what's the one thing he never does? He never says, get up. Never says, don't worship me. He accepts and receives anyone who bows to him because Jesus isn't a creature. Jesus was not created. Jesus has no beginning and no end. It's God in that manger. It's God with us. But it's more than that because Emmanuel also means God with us. That's the beautiful part, the glorious part. That's the part that means everything. There's a huge difference between knowing about God and being with God. It's one thing to experience God and quite another to meet him personally. Whenever God had come near before, he always looked like something terrifying. Look through the Old Testament. Think of the whirlwind. That appeared to Job, the smoking furnace that appeared to Abraham, the pillar of fire that appeared to the Israelites as they left Egypt. <clears throat> Even when God came down then, he remained unapproachable. But remember what John said in the first chapter of his gospel. The word became flesh. In Christ we find all the glory and majesty and power of God with none of the terror and all the love and peace. There's no barrier of guilt anymore because he took away the sins. He came to earth to live among us, to walk with us, to understand exactly what it meant and felt to be human. He's not the great unknowable God way up there in heaven. He's the God who understands the human heart better than humans do and who knows how hard it is to live this life and who loves you so much that he stripped himself of all of his holy glory to wear skin and bones so he could die for you. That's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's God with us. And finally, he's also God with us. But now wait, that's, that, I mean, that's kind of a limited term, isn't it? You're not supposed to talk like that anymore. Us. It's, 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 not, it's not God with all, is it, though? No, it's God with us. So who's the us that Matthew's talking about here? Does he mean the people who have earned the right for God to dwell with them? No, nope, can't be that. Can't earn that. There's no power we can have and nothing we can do to earn that. So who is it then? Who is the us? The us is always the people who are invited. And everybody's invited. The people who are humble, the poor in spirit, the meek, the brokenhearted, the lost. It's the shepherds, it's the outcasts, the people society doesn't want. The us in this verse are always the people who receive the gift of Christ knowing that they can't pay for it. A gift that's free but costs everything, both for us and for him. Christmas is all about getting near 
to the God who came near to us. And so often that means getting rid of the limitations that we put on ourselves. We have to take seriously the fact that Jesus is God. And doing that means getting rid of the judgments that you make of what you think God can and can't do in your life. Joseph's problem deep down wasn't that he couldn't believe what Mary told him. We know the sort of man Joseph was, but Mary was just as trustworthy and every bit as righteous, even more so. As amazing as it was, some part of Joseph had to know she was telling the truth. All the angel did was confirm it. No, Joseph's problem was really that he didn't think God could do something so wonderful in the, in the life of a poor carpenter. In his life. And that's something we all struggle with, don't we? God can do anything. We know that. We get that. We believe that. But we also know and get and believe that God, as powerful as he is, can't do anything with us. Because we're just not that special. Christmas reminds us just how wrong we are when we think that. It's a time of joy, of hope, of love, but most of all, it's a time of peace. Peace between you and the God who made you. Peace between your sins and his forgiveness. Peace between who you know you are and who God knows you can be. So I ask all of you this coming week to take a moment to look at all God did just to be with you. And then ask yourself what you're doing to be with him. Let's pray. Father, we pray that during this challenging Christmas season, the light of your love shines upon us even brighter. We pray that the glory of your Son overflows our hearts and that we find the true and meaningful and endless peace of knowing that because of Christmas, you are with us. That because of Christmas, you are with us. And that because of Christmas, you are with us. So let our hearts be glad. Let our spirits be lifted. Let our souls rejoice in the knowledge that you entered this world by love to offer us hope. And let that knowledge carry us through every dark moment. For we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and every day. Amen.